Jacob. I just found out that he's, this is only the second time they've asked a student to present. So we had to throw the pressure on right before we got here. Um, I was really excited when Courtney invited us to talk about this work because um, as many of us who've worked on the project know, we ran into a lot of hurdles this summer as Jacob was trying to do his master's work in Kenya, which I think was on a small scale and maybe also felt like on a large scale for him, an example of how challenging global health can be. But he was very innovative and worked very hard to come up with an alternative um, strategy to not only have a great and meaningful experience there, but to do work that would further the project while we were um, awaiting some regulatory and um, uh, programming delays in the app, which he'll tell you about. So I'm really just here to set the stage for some of his work. Um, I know some of you guys are in my class um, and have heard um, talks either in the class or at the faculty meeting, but my work is in cervical cancer. Um, which is a disease which exemplifies um, global health disparities. I think it's a um, really great, um, if tragic example of if tragic example of how um, wealth and social status really determine your um, opportunities for health. So it represents about three percent of cancers and cancer-related deaths worldwide. Um, last year, Global Can, which is an international or, um, epidemiologic organization that estimates cancer. Um, rates estimated that there were almost 600 new cases and over 300,000 um, deaths. And these numbers were surprising because they outpaced the WHO's estimates of um, incidence and mortality rates um, for 2030. Um, the incidence and mortality aligned closely with the Human Development Index, um, and 90% of the world's cases and deaths occur in low and middle income countries. So here, um, these are maps that you, as students, see, I think in many of your classes where you see the worst disease concentrated in lower and middle income <coughs> countries, the dark blue. Countries have the highest incidence and it's really concentrated here in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's a combination of both the resource availability for screening and the coexisting epidemic with HIV, which sort of synergistically works to um, both impact the healthcare infrastructure and availability of screening and treatment for other diseases and um, is a risk factor for cervical cancer. This is a, um, the same Global Can organization um, on that showing mortality of cervical cancer. And again, we see those same rates, um, if more dramatic, um, among mortality um, in um, Sub-Saharan Africa. So in the um, face of this, <laughs> Last year, last May, Dr. Tejas, who's the Secretary General of the WHO, made a global call for the elimination, toward the elimination of cervical cancer, um, which the WHO has done for other diseases, such as um, smallpox and polio. And he said that cervical cancer is one of the most preventable and treatable forms of cancer. These are highly effect cost effective. However, cervical cancer remains one of the greatest threats to women's lives. And globally, one woman dies of cervical cancer every two minutes, and this suffering is unacceptable and cannot continue. So in the setting of these sort of increasing numbers of incidents and mortality, um, and the disparities we're seeing, why the call for elimination now? Um, one, because that disparity is increasing. Um, but two, because we know we have effective screening programs that have really worked to reduce the incidence and mortality of cervical cancer in high-income countries. We've seen evidence that these screening strategies can work um, in low-income countries, and there is a push towards technology that will uh, um, facilitate the implementation of even more effective screening and treatment technology in low- and middle-income countries. But really, it's driven by the availability of an extremely effective vaccine for HPV. There is now, um, so just, uh, I guess, um, standard setting, everyone knows that HPV is the virus that causes cervical cancer. I, I hope you all know that. I made that assumption. But now there's a vaccine that covers nine types of HPV, seven of which are thought to, to um, contribute or be at high risk for cervical cancer. Um, and it's thought to be 95% effective um, against cervical cancer. So almost 100% effective against the vaccine, um, the HPV types covered in the vaccine, which would cover about 95% of cervical cancers worldwide. So since this call for elimination, um, the WHO has released these draft 
um, guidelines for a definition for elimination and what um, would be targets for 2030 to align with the sustainable development goals. So the vision is a world without cervical cancer. Um, the actual definition that they're proposing for elimination is a rate of disease which is consistent with a rare disease, so four for every 100,000. The goal by 2030 is a 30% reduction in mortality for cervical cancer. And so the targets are to have 90% of girls fully <coughs> vaccinated with HPV vaccine by 15 years of age, 70% um, of women screened at least <coughs> once, maybe twice, and then 90% of women with invasive cancer treated are able to receive palliative therapy. And I feel like this is a really important pillar because we often think about what's most cost effective and preventative and we forget the 590,000 women that are diagnosed with cervical cancer every year. So I like that the WHO put that on an equal footing with these prevention measures. Um, so this is really just sort of a starting um, line, these sort of aspirational goals. Um, there remain a lot of key questions um, to be addressed for elimination. These aren't saying that if these goals are met by 2030, we'll have eliminated cervical cancer. Each country's elimination target or um, threshold will be different, which is sort of dependent, dependent on their baseline HPV rate, rates, their current rates of screening, um, and then the other um, factors within their healthcare system. So the questions that are being addressed now are, what combination of screening and vaccination strategies can re lead to elimination at what, what threshold? So who knows what the vaccination rates in the US are for HPV among girls? Low. Low. <laughs> like, are they close to 90%? Under <laughs> 50%. Yeah, so they're closer to about 38 or 40%. So, you know, at what, what would it mean to reach 90% and what happens if we reach, we get close to it and miss it? And who should we target to be most effective? We haven't been effective in the US targeting adolescent girls and boys at the same time. So what's effective, what's cost effective? Um, and when would elimination be reached? How would that be different um, by strategy and by country? Um, what are the costs um, and cost efficiencies or cost effective strategies to reach elimination? But what I work on are how can these strategies reach the most vulnerable populations? So we have very aspirational goals. We have a lot of people in wealthy countries that are um, modelers that are doing important work to look at how we can do this on a meta scale, but how can we do it individually um, within the countries that, um, that have these high rates of cervical cancer reaching the populations that are most at risk? So I'm gonna give you an example of something that I do. I'm an implementation <coughs> scientist, which is exactly, someone who answers exactly that question. How do we get the evidence-based solutions to the populations that could use them in a way that's acceptable, sustainable, um, and feasible? So I've been working on cervical cancer control in Kenya since 2006 or 2007. Um, you know, there are a lot of different ways you can describe Kenya. I obviously have a huge amount of affection for it, but I, and I hate to distill it as just an East African pet bar country, but it is a country with a high HIV prevalence. Um, it has been supported by PEPFAR, which is the president's plan for AIDS relief. Um, it was one of the earliest target countries. Um, it has now become a 90-90-90 target country, so a country that is on route to meet these, um, these uh, um, newest goals of 90% of people tested for HIV, um, started on treatment and reaching virologic suppression, and um, it has about 64% ART coverage among people who are HIV positive. So that's a number, um, it, you know, it's not 100%, um, but it, it represents a ton of work and infrastructure development that's been done by both the Kenyan government and the um, donor community. It's also a country with high rates of both cervical and breast cancer. The latest um, estimate of cervical cancer incidence was 22 per 100,000, and that's really driven by low levels of screening. So there's some, um, some contribution from the HIV impact, but really women don't have access to screening, and if they have screening, they often don't have access to treatment. So the vaccine program has been announced, not quite yet implemented yet. Um, so HPV uh, vaccine should be available this year in Kenya. 
So I work in rural Western Kenya. So within countries, there are disparities within, um, um, between high and um, low income people within the country. So um, Kenya has these large cities of Nairobi and Mombasa, which really kind of are like Western cities, have huge airports, have, you know, uh, Nairobi has about 70,000 expats living there, um, working for the UN and other agencies. And then you get to outside of Nairobi, like Northern Kenya and Western Kenya, it can feel really, really um, rural. So this, um, Megori is situated on Lake Victoria. About 85% of, of the population has less than a secondary school education. It's a very agricultural economy, so it's fishing and sugarcane farming. Um, it has a very limited healthcare infrastructure, but also a very limited um, uh, transportation infrastructure, electricity, availability of clean water. And it has the highest prevalence um, of HIV in the country due to some of these healthcare indicators, but also some um, cultural practices that have potentiated HIV transmission. Um, so eight, um, I work in Magori because I started working um, with this clinic in Western Kenya about 12 years ago. And my mentor um, worked on this model of HPV, of community health campaign, HIV testing and linkage. So it took this sort of high needs, highly vulnerable population in Magori, and through offering HIV testing and linkage to care through these community health campaigns, was able to achieve 90, 90, 90 targets. So they were sort of the first um, site in <coughs> Africa. So there was Western Kenya and Uganda where this project was done. And they were able to um, show that the community would come out and not just come out for this one time testing opportunity, but then would be able to be linked into care. So with that context, we wanted to see if we could use an analogous model to address cervical cancer screening, which also could be a one-time, once-in-a-lifetime screening, um, with a need for linkage to care by using this community health campaign model. So we developed a study um, to, to see if offering screening using self-collected HPV testing, so getting it out of the health facility, um, uh, eliminating the need for skilled workers, eliminating the need for um, all of the supplies and equipment and sterilization that goes with the health <coughs> exam, um, and offer women a swab that they could self-collect either in a health facility over a continuous amount of time or in a community health campaign that would come for maybe one or two days to their rural village. Um, so we had a two-part cluster randomized trial. I'm not gonna get too much into the study design. Um, and we distilled cervical cancer screening into four components that both the intervention communities, which had the community health campaigns, and the control communities had. So they had outreach and education around cervical cancer and HPV. They were offered um, screening with self-collected HPV. Um, they got their results notification either through a home visit or um, a phone call or a text message. And everyone was offered free treatment um, if they were HPV positive at the county hospital. So everything was provided free of charge, but we didn't do any transport reimbursement or um, incentives for study participants. So the difference was whether that screening would take place in the health facility or in the community health campaign. So here's just some pictures I think that describe our experience. We did a ton of mobilization. These are um, community health volunteers um, that we did a, a cervical cancer screening training with that then blanketed the community with the messaging. This is the reproductive health coordinator with our study coordinator. So we did a lot of, um, this was implemented in collaboration with the Ministry of Health. This is one of our campaigns, um, one of our tents. Here's some of our community, some of our education. And this is important because we're saying we're gonna offer women the chance to self-screen in tents. Um, in a lot of places in Africa, you can get a lot of things made special order that would be a lot more expensive here. So here are tents that have floor to ceiling curtains. Um, so that we had four private areas that women could go um, and um, get undressed and do the self-collection themselves. We did tablet-based data entry, and then we, this is a stock photo, but we notified women of their results um, by phone. So in a nutshell, what did we found, find? So we did a ton of evaluation over the um, five and a half year project. We found that CHDs were well attended, were more well attended and less expensive than health facilities. 
for HPV testing. Um, however, we were still only reaching about 50% of the population. So we weren't reaching those HIV 90, 90, 90 targets, but we were doing better than about 8%, which is um, what we think was the screening rate um, before we got there. Um, HPV positivity was 20 to 23%, which is um, accurate given um, other population-based studies in the in the region, it was higher in the health facility arm, likely because more of the people attending health facilities were attending for HIV care and those women have higher rates of HPV. We found that attrition between screening and treatment was high. And we found that although over two thirds of women chose some sort of cell phone based results, um, women um, who were more, um, women who received a home visit were more likely to follow up for treatment. So people wanted to have the convenience of cell phone based results, but it wasn't as effective of having a face-to-face -face conversation or more information or some, some special sauce that they received with a home visit, even though the people who chose cell phone based results were likely to have more evidence of a closer connection to the healthcare system. So they had prior HIV testing, they'd been on family planning. Um, so we, we looked at that, and so despite indicators that would suggest they would be able to get to treatment more, more easily, they weren't. Um, and so we sort of wanted to figure out how we could adapt our model to address that. And then finally, we did a ton of qualitative work um, to figure out what people's experiences were as they navigated through screening and treatment and try to use some of that information to improve the model. What we found were persistent misconceptions in the relationship between HPV and cervical cancer in that people <laughs> finding out this information for the first time had a really hard time differentiating a diagnosis of HPV from cancer. And the resultant fear in some cases seemed like it could be paralyzing. Like I was, I just thought I was going to die and so I didn't see any reason to come in for treatment or it made me really delay to come into treatment. People felt like the, the model of care for HIV, which is a chronic lifetime of being in treatment on medication, um, that has really, there's been a very successful community and public health messaging campaign about that. And so it was hard to um, differentiate a diagnosis of HPV, which would really be a one-time treatment with a life, lifetime, like getting on a, um, a medication-based treatment for their life. We felt, uh, women reported that there was um, uh, a lower confidence in the CHV or community health volunteer-led messaging. Um, even though they liked the ability to self-collect, they wanted more confidence that, that what they were being told was coming from a reliable source. Um, and we also found that partner and community support played a big factor in treatment uptake. So um, people's social network or um, their husband or family um, often providing financial support, but all, being um, being able to help them, uh, being able to disclose to those people was related to um, higher rates of both screening and treatments. So we can't address all of that with mHealth, but we thought maybe since we were starting to do some of this text messaging um, to address the transportation gaps and sort of the, the supply line gaps, how could mHealth, how could we broaden our work in mHealth to address these gaps that we were finding throughout the study? So there's a million definitions for M Health. We're writing a grant now, and the NIH uses the definition um, that I have up here. It's the use of mobile or wireless devices to improve health outcomes, healthcare services, or health research. You might hear digital health um, or other terms for it, but you know it's generally using some sort of um, mobile device within a healthcare setting. It's become increasingly popular and widespread. Um, as a strategy to manage some more complex health initiatives in settings with limited resources, so to provide health messaging, um, appointment reminders to, um, for providers, it can be a decision, um, a clinical decision-making tool. Um, so there's a lot of work going on to, to look at how to use mHealth, how to measure the use of mHealth, how to determine um, where are the, the best settings to implement mHealth. So in the Kenyan setting, um, there is a greater than 80% cell phone ownership in rural areas. We found that. We asked women if they had a cell phone that they, they owned or were more comfortable to use. Um, and it matched some of the, um, the, um, the bigger estimates that we had, I guess more official estimates. 
M-Pesa is a company, um, it's a mobile money management system initiated in Kenya. It's been replicated in other low-income countries. It reaches 93% of Kenyans. It's a way for people to send money over their phone or get money. If someone sends me 20 bucks, I can go to an M-Pesa station and get 20 bucks in cash. 93% of Kenyans use M-Pesa, and there are over 1.7 million transfers per year. So the use of... Um, of cell phones for things other than just talking um, is a model, and I would say that mobile money management is a pretty integral part of, of um, someone's uh, life. Text messaging has been shown to be effective in HIV prevention activities in both uh, post-circumcision and EMTCT strategies in Western Kenya. Um, and then we, um, within different areas of Western Kenya, there have been large-scale pilots of M Health technology for CHE support. So we thought okay, this was a good environment. Um, and we learned from phase one that we had both promise and limitations of our um, mobile phone use. So we um, got a grant from the Duke Global Oncology um, Program, or Global Cancer Program, to develop a mobile application to improve um, knowledge, so improve patient knowledge and follow-up. Um, we sought first to gain a better understanding of CHV's needs, capacity, and workflow um, to help inform that strategy. Um, and then we were able last year to work with some student developers um, here at Duke to develop a prototype for mHealth. So we had a lot of big goals, <laughs> um, but we decided to, um, given our funding and you know the time and capacity of the student developers, <coughs> we divided our um, our app needs. Um, our app desires into needs and wants. We developed a name, MSADA, which means support in Swahili. Um, and uh, actually, the M in front of it is a Swahili word. It's not just because it's, um, it's mobile. Um, and um, so we decided we wanted to develop an app that would provide counseling support for CHVs with some images. Um, and decision support tools so they'd be able to follow the protocol. And then we wanted a way to do patient and specimen trackings because we would need to match the um, women with their HPV results um, as it goes to the lab and as the results go back to the women. What we want, which we haven't been able to develop so far, are patient educational messaging and service reminders. Now we've done that separately through computer programs where we individually <coughs> send out these batch messages, but it hasn't been integrated into MSADA. Um, and it wasn't able to be developed by the team last year. Um, and we wanted to develop tools that would generate reports or some strategy by which the CHVs could track the, um, the patients easily who, um, in order to do their follow-up in um, sort of more of a user-friendly way. And then we want to develop a report generation um, strategy for the <coughs> county health management team. So the government wants to know what's going on in their um, counties. And, they want to be able to track it, and so we want a way to automatically share our aggregate data with them. So we got students to, to sort of meet these needs over the course of the school year um, last year and the summer, um, and we are applying for a, a grant to um, uh, add these additional features to MSADA. So we had this app. Um, at the end of the year, which um, Jacob was going to test in a pilot study um, for his master's project, so he can talk about his um, experience doing that, what he thought would happen and what happened. All right, so before I get into what did or didn't happen this summer, um, according to the original plans, I want to stop and thank Dr. Hutchko as well as the other members of the Center for Global, uh, Global Reproductive Health for allowing me the opportunity to take part in this research as well as the support they've offered throughout my uh, time here at DJHI as well as in the field and that to include uh, Yu Jung Choi as well as uh, the Kasumu-based staff, <coughs> Sandra Grano Ketch, Alifet uh, Otungas, Saduma Ibrahim, and then Brendan Makulo. Um, also, we have in the back uh, Dennis Harsh, who is our current app developer. He's made tremendous strides getting acclimated to the project um, and making some changes that we got through the iterative development process this summer since August um, and actually helped us get this pilot started. Um, so uh, <coughs> immense thanks to him for taking that over um, from the previous app developers from 2018 <coughs> into the summer. So as Jack Dutchko alluded to, um, 
I originally went to Kasumi this summer for my field work experience, planning to conduct a three-month pilot or start a three-month pilot of MSADA um, within three clinical facilities, um, testing with a, a small sample size of about 12 uh, community health volunteers to get some real-time provider feedback on the usability, acceptability, feasibility of MSADA within the Kasumi context. However, as Dr. Legrand put it to me yesterday, global health happened and <laughs> plans changed. Um, we had some IRB delays, some tech programming issues, and so we had to kind of pivot about midway through my time in Kasumu <clears throat> and come up with a new approach to make use of my time more perfectly, but also hopefully to improve um, the MSADA platform that we had kind of put together through May of this year. So the overall goal of what I'll be presenting today was um, the iterative development project where we were looking to refine and further develop the MSADA platform prior to completion or initiation of the pilot study. Um, and we had a very cyclical process where we were going out, um, not necessarily going out, but bringing people in to gather their feedback on the app, the platform as it stood, integrate that feedback, and then again seek more feedback on the changes we had made integrate additional feedback. So in reality, we made one full loop in my time in the field, but since then we've made many more loops, as Dennis will probably tell you. I've been quite uh, persistent about things. So, um, but I'll just get into this and kind of orient you into my presentation. I plan to just give an overview of the study methods and things that were conducted this summer, and then kind of a uh, then and now of the MSADA platform based on the feedback that we gathered in the field. So the uh, iterative development study was about a five week study between June and, uh, or sorry, July and August of this summer, and it was um, conducted in both Magori and Kasumu, Kenya. Um, so Kasumu was a little bit more urbanized, um, or a more urban area compared to Magori, but we were getting feedback from both areas. And then we conducted six iterative feedback sessions. So we broke it up um, into a kind of a week by week schedule um, in planning for the study. So week one was to, the intent was to conduct um, three feedback sessions with about four participants each, so a total of 12 people across three days, um, gather all of their feedback, kind of parse through it, um, talk as a team about the changes we wanted to make, and then hand that over to the app developer to integrate changes. Um, and originally, you'll see here we have week one, three sessions, weeks two through four, feedback integration, and then week five, three more sessions. I was a little um, ambitious in my first timeline of this, and we were going a week at a time. I was planning for three weeks of sessions, as well as three weeks of um, feedback integration, which is one week in between, but that was um, kind of ignorant on my part, because we received a lot of feedback. Um, that has improved the app, but also takes time to integrate. Um, and I don't have a comp sci background, so my assumptions of all that be a really quick change, not necessarily the case. <clears throat> so, and we had a mixed methods approach for the data collection. We um, did do in-depth interviews um, after kind of a group session introduction to the platform, and I'll kind of get some of those activities later. And then we um, complemented that with, uh, with a usability survey. Um, and I'll really focus on and really the focus was from the qualitative data. The usability survey piece was kind of my own desire. If this ended up, if the pilot study didn't happen, I wanted a thesis that was mixed methods, so I kind of tucked that in there. Um, but really the qualitative piece was what helped strengthen our development of the app. So the study population we worked with for these feedback sessions, <clears throat> so we had a convenient sample of 19 individuals, and we broadly grouped them into three categories. The first being what we called experts. So they were OBGYNs or other higher level providers who had a strong understanding of the cervical cancer screening protocol currently being implemented in Kasumu um, and could offer some of that high level, uh, maybe more expert opinion on the features of the app, what we had or had not included in the way it was presented. Um, our next uh, participant group, were end users, and so these are the CHVs who are actually going to be using the app in the facility. Um, we didn't, we had already um, consented and gathered study participants for the pilot study, which was delayed, and so this is the Magori piece. We went to Magori, 
and spoke with um, community health volunteers who had previously done screening through the community health campaign or within the health facility in the R1 Dr. Edgeco, um spoke about earlier. And then, um, so we got feedback from those CHVs rather than the ones based in Kisumu. And then the last group were lay users, so individuals who were either part of research staff or some sort of clinical orientation, but not specifically um, cervical cancer care. And so most of them had HIV um, focus either through research or through clinical care. Um, so we just want to get a kind of a layperson perspective on the app to kind of get any any varied perspective that might offer some sort of um, improvement to the app based on the feedback they could they could provide to us. And then um, I think what was quite uh, beneficial was a mix of first time as well as repeat users. So we had uh, week one three feedback sessions and week five three more feedback sessions. And some of the individuals from week one were again repeated in week five, but also in week five we did have some new people to see the app. So we got some fresh perspective after we have made these changes, uh, but we also got some um, continuity there for the people who originally gave us some feedback to see we implemented the changes. Okay, were these the changes that you were wanting us to implement? How did we do, you know, is this what you were thinking when you told us, hey, make the changes X, Y, and Z? And so the study activities, um, we kind of walking through how these feedback sessions went. Um, we started off with a screen by screen, feature by feature walkthrough of the app in a group setting with all four participants. And so we'll, I'll, I'll show you um, kind of, I know you don't necessarily know what the app is or the, all the features, but I'll kind of walk through that um, later. But we, we did feature by feature and went through every single screen to show all of the components, how it worked, how to transition from screen to screen so that people felt oriented and had kind of a, a basic understanding of everything that was encompassed within, within MSADA. And then we moved to simulation activities where they were able to actually use the app in pairs or in groups to kind of feel out those features and get a sense of how they actually worked rather than just kind of going step by step. And so those simulation activities included a client provider role play. So one of the features of MSADA is um, patient data collection or client data collection where you're getting clinical indicators as well as when the client goes to screen, tracking their um, barcode for their specimen to be sent to the lab. And so we had them pair up and go through a few times of one person was holding the phone using the app and the other person was being client and they went through all of in order all the questions, we provided scripts so they could kind of use different skip patterns and see, oh, you know, if someone was progressing through the survey but they realized, oh, I gave you a wrong answer, the, the user would have to go back and kind of try to simulate some real world, real, um, real time possibilities, what it might be like to work with a client and some of the ways you'd be engaged with the application. Then we had a client Q&A uh, activity. So one of the other main features is an FAQ or questions um, feature as we call it, that has, that kind of addresses those myths and misperceptions um, about HPV, about cervical cancer that Dr. Ochoa mentioned earlier, um, that has, it's broken down in by category um, of topics related to different questions. And then we just posed what a question that as a client might ask um, to the, uh, study participants and they had to use the phone to answer that question. And so um, we tried to uh, again make it as real world as possible and not ask things directly, oh what is the cause of cervical cancer and they can just search that in the question feature and give you an answer. We tried to ask it in a way that actual clients might ask. Um, and then we had a screening demonstration where they used the third feature of the app to actually explain to an example client how to go through the screening process of self-collection. And then finally, um, client data retrieval. So the fourth feature of the app is um, the ability to view previously entered records, edit, um, or make changes as needed. And so we had it earlier on in the client provider role play. They had entered in a few example patients. And then at the end, we followed up and had them go and try to retrieve that information and give us a few facts about that person based on the record they had entered. Finally, again, like I said, we did in-depth interviews and the usability surveys on the individual basis after they had oriented themselves and become more familiar with the app itself. And so some of our um, key findings from the qualitative work. First, um, study participants found the features and overall layout to be quite comprehensive and they felt it was appropriate. However, there were recommendations 
regarding the ordering of the app. And so if you see here on the left, you have um, then the May version of um, MSADA, and then now the October version of MSADA. And this is a wireframe that we can complete in the field, not an actual screenshot, whereas this is an actual screenshot from the phone. Um, but they wanted us to reorganize the main features on the phone in a way that made chronological sense. So when women would come to us, come to be screened, there's a certain order by which they follow the protocol, the CHVs follow the protocol. To screen the women, um, they start by giving like an individual health talk to explain HPV and cervical cancer, what they're going to be doing in the screening process. Then they move on to collect the client data. At that point, um, clients go and screen, the specimen is collected and sent to the lab, and then they'll follow up if the client has any questions about the process, about HPV that they may have thought of in the time they've been in the visit. And then finally, if the last feature being search client, later on they would, this would be likely the, the least used, and so they suggested we kind of reorder it in that way so that CHVs um, who are using the phone can kind of just go step by step and not have to kind of bounce around the screen and kind of make more sense of it. And again, kind of pushing those more frequently used questions to the top rather than um, having them towards the bottom. Second key finding was that most participants found the usability and responsiveness to be high and thought the app was easy to learn and use. And so the didn't really have many tech issues with the with the study phones itself um, and like issues where if you click a certain button it takes you to some screen you didn't intend for it to go. Um, so that was a, a good plus. But there was some discrepancy on whether or not certain features were easy to learn. Um, and if you look here, so the questions feature, um, and I'll show it to you later, you, you click questions feature, or questions, and it takes you to a list of topics, and then with, you can click a topic. Within that topic, you're given um, a few questions with answers. And finding that and kind of thinking, okay, a client asked me a question about HPV uh, transmission. <coughs> How do I go then find the answer for her? Um, that was something that CHVs or study, study participants felt might be hard to learn or might take some time to um, kind of familiarize yourself with the location, how to get to this information so that you can report it to the client appropriately. Um, but that was really the only feature that was kind of uh, pointed out to be a little, might take some more time to, to get used to and to use effectively and efficiently. And then finally, graphics implemented were well received, and there was a lot of compliments regarding you know, the use of graphics for explanatory purposes as you're going through the screening process and kind of that client education <coughs> in the beginning. But um, we had, there was some uh, concern that it might not be appropriate for, some of the images might not be appropriate, appropriate for both rural and urban settings. So for example, one of the study participants um, I don't think I included it here, but there are some images in the education module um, that demonstrate how um, the client should complete self-collection. And there's also images that show, um, kind of highlight where the female reproductive system is within a woman's body. And those were kind of seen as maybe not appropriate or might be someone, someone said might, um, the old mamas in the rural communities might find that bad manners. So, you know, talk about that, show it, speak about it. So just kind of um, thinking a little bit about those images to make sure that we have, um, they're appropriate for all settings. And then um, participants uh, really liked the simple and direct language. Um, we really tried to make sure um, the information presented in the app, which is going to be relayed to a client, is understandable at all levels and isn't over-medicalized, jargony information. Um, but originally, in May, it only had English. Um, because the CHVs would be the ones who are using the app, not the clients, um, we kind of, I guess, made the assumption that they could translate information themselves if a client felt more comfortable in Duluo or Kiswahili. Um, but it was recommended that we go ahead and translate everything within the app, so that way, if there is a certain client who comes and would prefer information or better understand information to the work Swahili, that was directly available, and we weren't uh, then asking the CHVs to try to take the English information and translate it into one of the other languages. The concern was somewhere in that translation, information or meaning 
might be lost or misconstrued in a way that we don't want it to be. Um, so we followed that recommendation and went ahead and translated all of the information within the app um, into all three languages. And, um, and so here's an example of that. This is a screenshot from the education module, and you can see in the English version on the left, or if you speak Swahili or Lua, you can see in the other two versions. This is just at the very beginning describing, you know, you're here today, we're going to be talking about, um, you know, high, the chance of um, developing cancer, cervical cancer if you have um, HPV. And we translated that into uh, Swahili in the middle and Lua here on the side. And then again, also in the step-by-step -step, um, guidelines for self-collection, that information is also translated into the three languages with him. And that's an example of one of the images kind of showing the, in, showing the woman how, or the client, how to remove the swab for then to collect the specimen. We um, did uh, come across some, or some feasibility concerns were raised by some of the participants. Um, and thinking of having this app based in the facility rather than being taken home with a CHV when they're using it during the pilot study or in regular clinical use. Um, thinking about charging, we wouldn't want the health facility to be relying on this phone and then it doesn't get charged overnight and they're in the middle of a screening in the middle of the day and it dies and now all the women who might be there to be screened can't be screened, have to come some, addition, some later date. Um, also, the need for internet connection to upload client data. And so this is, it, it is addressed, um, but it's still, the client data can be collected without internet connection, but you still have to at some point either have data or connect to wire the Wi-Fi to upload that to the um, secured server. And so that kind of um, two parts, two part process was a little bit um, concerning for some people. And then also um, reliable technical support. So obviously, within the context of this research study, we have dentists, we have um, resources here at Duke that can help us with any tech issues we run into, but then if it were going to be taken into a facility and used permanently, would they have um, the appropriate technical support to maintain the app um, if they were to run into issues? And then finally, um, this is kind of like our takeaway from some of the struggles we had or some of the uh, barriers we encountered during our study was the need for reliable and stable solutions for both app programming as well as back-end data storage. And again, that kind of harkens back to the technical piece, making sure you have app developers who have the capacity and the time to make any changes or maintain the app as needed. So I want to give a um, quick kind of then and now of the app before uh, the iterative development feedback and then after. And I'm conscious sometimes, so I'm going to try to get through this quickly so you can ask any questions you may have. Um, so this was the app in May. This is um, demonstrating the uh, screening info feature. So it's right here. And so previously, you would click on that screening info button, and then click to begin and go directly to the English version, which you then scroll through <coughs> to explain what the plan is for the day, the session, how to um, collect the, the specimen. Um, but now, that's been changed to add some information. And I'll just click, so you click screening info, which again, we move to the top, click education module, and then you have the option to select whichever language the client might prefer. And so I've put it here in English, but you could um, choose Kiswahili or Dulu. And you would be taken to that version of the education module in that language. We've um, kind of updated and rearranged that education module so that it's, um, draws more attention is hopefully more clear when they're going through <coughs> that information. Um, but you see that step by step there. And we've also included the second box here, screening guidelines. This information is really for the benefit of the CHVs, not necessarily for the client, but it is um, information from the Ministry of Health guidelines regarding cervical cancer screening, what they recommend. Um, it has information regarding risk factors, key populations, um, screening methods, treatment methods, and what's, what is and what is not appropriate. Um, the next feature then and now, um, so this is again the May version of the um, add new patient feature, so the data collection um, aspect. And an interesting, an interesting thing that we ran across with language, um, question 25, if you can't see, says which of the following notifications are okay? And it's after you've screened for 
or after you've collected your um, specimen and it's been sent to the lab, how would you like to receive your results? Um, and you have the option of phone call, text message, home visit, return to clinic. And we got a lot of feedback regarding, you know, if you say which of the following is okay, people are just going to say all four of them. Okay. Also, this didn't originally distinguish between which of the following is okay if you're HPV positive versus if you're HPV negative. Um, and so that kind of, that context and that nuance is very, I realized, very important to using um, anything in, within a clinical <coughs> setting or a setting outside of the U.S. You really have to be cognizant of how the meaning and language kind of transfers from one place to another. And so you can see that we've changed, again, you have the option for the client survey in all three languages, but we've changed this to distinguish between um, HPV positive, HPV negative, and then which of the following would you prefer for your notification. And that's just one example. There are lots of examples, lots of feedback on the client survey about how we can be more, um, more clear and more precise in our language and how it's going to be interpreted by clients. The questions feature, which is um, represented here, like I said, if you click questions, you're taken to a grouped um, by topic screen where you can look at HPV vaccination questions, you can look at how is HPV and cervical cancer related to HIV, um, also things about transmission. And again, we've translated all of that information into um, the three languages so that since this is really where we're hoping to get the most um, bang for our buck regarding client education, we want women to feel comfortable in the language, able to understand what they're being told in whatever language they prefer. And so if you were to select a category, you would be taken to a list of all those questions within that category where you can scroll through. And then when you find the question that relates to whatever information you're trying to convey, you tap the screen and you have the information provided below. And you can also search based on some keyword to find questions related to kind of speed up that process. And then finally, the fourth feature, the search client feature, which is called search patient here in the May version, was, so these are all example records, no actual Kenyan woman's information is represented here. Um, but it was originally only being searched by client name, and we got a lot of feedback again about how a lot of people have the same name, or even the same two or same three names. And so we wanted to add additional search fields to help refine those results so that you're not mistakenly editing or accessing some other client's record. And so we added in um, the client name, or maintain the client name, but also added in age, date of birth, whoever the CHP who has administered the survey, as well as the barcode, which is a unique identifier for that specimen that's collected, or that self-collection specimen. So, Next steps, a pilot, finally. Um, we started the pilot officially yesterday. Um, so we have um, 11 CHVs who are using the app. Yesterday, eight of those 11 used the app and were able to screen a total of 16 women. So that's a great first step. Hopefully, we can keep that up over the next two and a half months. Um, but you want to take this or? We're good. But, you know, that's a, that's a great step, but, you know, it's, it is going to be a continuous iterative process throughout the pilot study, um, so we'll see how kind of these changes <coughs> improve our results or maybe not, um, kind of get that real-time feedback that I mentioned earlier from the CHVs um, within a clinical setting with real patients. So kind of big takeaways from, you know, the work thus far. Um, we think mHealth can surely play a part in addressing some of the implementation of gaps in cervical cancer screening that Dr. Ashko identified. Um, and iterative, develop, iterative development um, with su su substantial contextual knowledge is really key to making any intervention work within a context that's not your own or here in the U.S. If I'm going, to Durham, if I'm going from Durham somewhere else, I really need to take into account and bring in those voices of people outside of my context wherever I'm going to do work. Um, and then, as I learned the hard way, this process of research in global health can be quite challenging, um, and there are a lot of you know, barriers or challenges that can be encountered, and I, given the 10 minutes we have remaining, I won't read these off to you, but I'm sure you all have a very strong understanding of these challenges that you've encountered. <coughs>
And so we can um, field any questions you may have about the uh, presentation, but also if you want to learn more, you can visit the website, the Twitter page, um, 